Now, in our house, there's six of us, and we all have our own ideas about what we need to do to get out the door. And I won't tell you, I, I chose actually uh, uh, for my kids' sake and my sake to not, not detail any of the various incidents that have happened when we've had to wake up to go someplace early. But it's amazing the things that you think you all of a sudden have to do when you're headed out the door, isn't it? But listen, if, if you've got something serious going on, you better be prepared to be unified in your effort. And in a sense, this is the heart of what Paul is saying in this passage. What he is doing as we walk from 12 through 16 in the book of Romans, he's got something that is a priority. He wants to see the mission of the gospel reach all peoples on earth and that people would find and follow Jesus with a sense of clarity. And he doesn't want just individuals to be involved in this mission, but he knows that the only way for us to effectively do that in any given time and place as a church is that we would be prepared to have a unity of effort. We would know what the priorities are. We wouldn't be sidetracked by various things like braiding our hair. You know, at 3.30 in the morning. But we would know what the essential things are. That we need to do so that we don't just have individuals serving the Lord, but imagine what it looks like for an entire church of people who are unified around what's central in the mission of God, serving their community, serving one another, serving the Lord, and having a, an, an enormous impact on the people around them. It takes unified effort. Paul is speaking this into a group of people in Rome who are incredibly divided. They come from a Jewish background, which was incredibly culturally different from those who came from a Roman Gentile background. The, the things that were important to each of those cultures, all of a sudden, some of those have to be set aside so that the, the central things become important. And Paul is wanting through this whole section to help us understand what those important things are. That's why we talked about in the beginning of chapter 12 being devoted to the Lord. Just a, a single hearted devotion that says I'm not going to be conformed by the world around me but transformed by the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in a devoted way so I can know and approve and live out the will of God. Then he says we need to serve one another as a body in a way that's like an interconnected family. That we need to depend on one another. We need to serve one another, nourish one another. Then he said we need our love to not be a hypocritical kind of love. And then he talked about our relationship to the government. We talked about that last week. Because one of the biggest things that can divide people is the way they relate to the government. But here as he ends this section, he actually wants to bring us back around to make sure that we have an urgency to be about the most important central things. And what he really says is the church experiences practical unity when we live a life of love with genuine urgency. What does it look like for us to really get the message of the gospel? It looks like we begin to live a life of love with a genuine urgency to it. An urgency, and we see that in the passage. And so we're going to break this passage up into two pieces. Maybe you saw in your text, it's broken up by paragraph. Verses 8 through 10 remind us of how important it is for us to focus on loving our neighbor. And then the second half of the passage, verses 11 through 14, encourage us to wake up from our slumber and embrace a sense of urgency spiritually. And so that's what we're going to focus on today. So the church experiences practical unity when we live a life of love with genuine urgency. And so this unity is seen and this unity of effort will be experienced when we, number one, love our neighbor as our highest responsibility. So there's two things he says that we need to be united around. The first thing he says we will, that will help us experience that is when we love our neighbor as our highest responsibility. Paul, Paul does a brilliant thing here. He starts in this section as he turns the corner after talking about the government. He says, owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. He does a brilliant thing here. 
he brings the scope of our activity, he brings the, the sort of the shape and scope of our activity in life back to focus on the environment that we have the most opportunity to impact. Those who are closest around us. You see, he just got done talking about the government, right? So he, he, he talked about our relationship to this big, sort of big picture, macro sort of thing. But when he wants to get, he, when he, he sort of slides that out of the way and says, here's the important work. Let me come back to what is really central here. And he says that loving our neighbor is our highest responsibility. He wants us to focus on the environment that we have the most opportunity to impact in the environment where we can genuinely measure our maturity as a person and whether we're fulfilling our responsibilities, we can measure it well. The way we treat our neighbor. Now here's a bit of the thrust of it. You may live, he says, under a crazy political regime any place in the world, but the basics of loving our neighbors is the primary focus and clear playing field on which you really take action as a person. The way that you l love the people closest to you. I would suggest Paul does this because of the common temptation that all of us have to spend our time focused on what we think is loving for people on a grand scale while neglecting our responsibility to love those closest to us. Are y'all with me? You see, there's a temptation, right? You know, we just got done talking about the government that people will, will dedicate themselves to activity that is about loving people on a grand scale, on a theoretical, a theoretical level, but they never really concern themselves with loving the people right in front of them. You see, he turns our focus back to focusing on our neighbor. You know, we can focus on the big issues of our political moment and convince ourselves we're engaging in important labor of love while really deceiving ourselves in the places that our lives matter most with those closest around us. It's an amazing thing that we could have such a gap where we believe we are trying to love the culture around us through how we stand up for certain things while neglecting actually loving the people closest to us. Listen, loving people far away who, have, who we have never met is always an easy substitute for the loving those close by. The people close by have real problems that require my real attention. And those in the general population have theoretical problems that only require my theoretical attention. In short, it's a lot easier to think we're loving someone as a keyboard warrior on social media than to actually love our family, our neighbors, and our community before us. Now he shows us more about this. He digs deeper into this priority, loving our neighbor as our highest responsibility. He, he shows us that loving our neighbor is an ongoing responsibility. He starts by saying, owe no one anything except to love each other for one who loves another who has fulfilled the law. The way Paul expresses this is, is by saying, owe no one anything except to love each other. Kind of an interesting choice of words, isn't it? Consider the context here and what, is, what he, it is that he's getting across. He's just said, pay the taxes you owe to the governing authorities. Remember that part? Pay what is owed. So he's using a bit of a play on words. He's like, dispose of that responsibility simply and clearly. Do it. But when you're done, focus on the ongoing responsibility that you will always have upon you to love your neighbor. In other words, there are many responsibilities you can do and be done with, but the ongoing responsibility to love each other is ever-present and must always be considered primary. That's what he's saying. And so he sa when he says, owe no one anything, some people see that as a, a, a sort of an a instruction for Christians never to go into debt at all or never to take a loan or never to get a mortgage or something like that. He's not talking about that. What he's saying is that, that we are to aim to not have obligations to people other than the primary obligation we've been given by God to love them. So we should seek to not put ourselves in situations where we haven't done and fulfilled our responsibilities uh, so that we can be free, actually, having, having done our responsibilities, to go beyond our responsibilities to actually loving them. He wants us to be free. See, loving our neighbor is an ongoing responsibility in his mind that we never finish paying. <laughs> you don't pay off that mortgage. 
It's the work of a Christian to daily wake up and consider how they can love their neighbor, how the closest people around them will experience the fruit of God's love running through them. That is the primary, ongoing, never-ending task of a Christian. Second way we see loving our neighbor fulfills an objective responsibility. It's an ongoing responsibility, but it's also a clear, objective responsibility. The the key to understanding Paul's motivation here in this passage is that he is speaking, again, to a group of Jewish and Gentile Christians. He's holding up the primacy of love for measuring their actions towards their neighbors and one another and showing that it's not out of step with the general instructions of the Old Testament law. So you had this battle, right, in the, in the Roman church. You know, should we do what the Old Testament law says, or should we listen to this new law that Jesus has proclaimed, that Paul is, has been emphasizing here, where, where he says that we're to, to love one another is the primary way in we ex- which we exercise our responsibilities. And in a sense, what Paul is saying is that, is that the, the, the call to love for a Christian is in tune with the law, not separated from it. Now, in, in one really clear sense, we've already talked about this <coughs> previously in our series on Romans, that we have become free from the details of the Old Testament law in some very specific ways. But the heart of it has always been found in terms of our actual actions towards one another in this summary at the end of the Ten Commandments where that are referenced here in the passage. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up, he says, in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what does he mean by that? He's saying that if we really had engaged the heart of the law with a real sincerity, it would have led us to the bullseye of loving our neighbor well. Like to properly have related to it, that would have been the case. He says sin causes us to improperly relate to the law. But now he's saying, thus, when he's instructing the Roman Christians to focus on a life of genuine love towards their neighbor, that, that if, if they were to focus on that, and, and Jewish people really had the heart of the law, they would end up in the same place. Because the summary of all of those commandments is love your neighbor. All of the commandments in some way are a way from protecting, uh, of protecting our neighbor from our sin. Or instructing us not to do damaging things to them so he gives us the examples of the back half of the ten commandments that relate to how we treat one another and says these are the same thing love is not just what you feel like doing now why does this matter well we have this problem where sometimes we want to use love as a cover for doing whatever we want Uh, love doesn't have any form or shape i just do what feels good to me what i prefer certainly that's what's loving it's expressed in two different ways in our culture actually our culture kind of gets gets all wrapped around some craziness in this it's expressed in two different ways in our culture love is doing whatever you want with a layer of niceness over it it's being nice it doesn't have any real meaning or require doing any difficult thing It's doing what feels good to us toward others. Love is doing what feels good. Then we have this sort of second type of thing where love is fighting for the truth. So, no, 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 it's not about that. It's about fighting for the truth. It doesn't require, you know, it doesn't require any real engagement of the heart and soul in it. It's just doing what's right. I loved them. Therefore, I did what was right and exercise my responsibilities doesn't require thinking about any deeper things about motive a sense of compassion the genuine heart and spirit in which we engage with other people as long as we feel like we got the letter of the law right we will consider ourselves loving this view essentially equates love entirely with truth and what we do which sounds like a good corrective to do whatever you want doesn't it do what's true So you have, on one hand, love is do whatever you feel good about, and on the other hand, love is do whatever is right. And and biblical love has more quality to it than either of those. 
And what really is happening here is, is he's showing that biblical love has a responsibility to actually do the right things, but also we've been seeing throughout the book of Romans that it's also motivated by the right reasons. And it has the right sense of delivery of spirit about it. And so let me just kind of give you a way of thinking of that. Love requires us to think more deeply. Now listen, a good chocolate chip cookie is a work of art. Can I get an amen? I mean, you haven't been giving me any amens on anything else this morning yet. But, but chocolate cookies, I feel like we can get on track here. Chocolate chip cookies are amazing if they're good. Now, what a chocolate chip cookie does, if you've ever thought about what makes it really work, is it takes sugar and salt, right? Puts them together in a good combination and adds chocolate, right? So, so you, you've got to kind of get all of those things in there in the in the right balance or else you get you know just a sweet cookie like imagine you just make a cookie that was just sugar i mean some sugar cookies maybe it would work but they always have salt in them you see that's the deal if they don't have salt in them they don't really taste good because you need that little bit of salt to really make the sugar stand out and then you need some flavor or else it just kind of tastes like salt and sugar fell in a bowl together does anybody follow me now all we're saying there with that is we're saying, like, to make a good chocolate chip cookie, you've got to consider more than one factor. You've got to bring those factors together in the right balance, and when you do, then you have a really good experience, right? And so essentially what's going on here is, is, is we learn from the scriptures that love is a many splendored thing. 1 Corinthians 13. I would recommend that you explore some of the passages that go into detail in love. Two Sundays ago, we looked at one of those. We talked about the ways that love isn't without hypocrisy. It gave us lots of flavors to include in our recipe. But if you go to 1 Corinthians 13, you get a whole bunch more. And you take that and you go, love has a really particular substance and recipe to it that that needs to be included or it fails to really be love so these simplistic views that says oh it's not really rooted in truth and i don't need to do the right things that's wrong oversimplified and where it's in these other ideas where it's like no it's just doing what is true in relation to other people it has no heart to it it's not about how i do it. it's not about the tone with which i approach it or the motivations i have no that's those are important also and without the recipe being right together it's not love so I just thought of three parts of the recipe that are helpful. Maybe you can write this down. In relating to our neighbors, it brings together a knowledge of what is true. It brings together a motivation, an aim to do them good. Right? To, to do the things that will really help them flourish. And a spirit of delivery that is kind. You see, all of these things are necessary for us to hear the responsibility that we have here to love our neighbor. Without them, we're not really loving our neighbor if we lack the right motivation, if we lack the truth and knowledge of how to care for them, if we lack the spirit of delivery that has a genuine sense of kindness and good purpose to it, none of that, then we will be lacking in love. So, so to summarize them, the right idea and the right motivation and the right emotion for the situation equals love. It brings us into contact with that responsibility. When we love in this way, we will not find ourselves in opposition to the heart of the law of God. And Paul wants his Jewish and Gentile brothers and sisters to recognize that love fulfills the heart of the law. So we should think about what's true. We should examine our motivations and we should deliver love with the right heart. But we're not done. There's a little bit more here in this, in this section. We see a third thing, that gar love guarantees that we will fulfill our lowest responsibilities. Let me tell you what I mean by that. As Paul wraps up his instruction to love in verse 10, he shows again that a focus on loving our neighbor will ultimately fulfill the responsibilities of the law by again getting at the practical heart of the law. You see, at the end of verse 10, he says, love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is fulfilling of the law. Now, at the bottom level, what he wanted to say to the Jewish Christians who were listening to this letter is that we're not going to actually fall below the waterline. We're going to call ourselves to go further. At the heart of what God does as he aims us at living lives that imitate Christ is to go further than what the law requires, not, not stop short of it. And, and so how, how do we see that? Well, if 
think about what the laws were. You see, love requires more than the law, but never misses the basic thrust of it. In, in, in basic, the law was designed to protect our neighbor from harm. Protect our neighbor from the harm of our sin. That, that's the idea. Now, Paul, in a sense, says that since love seeks to go beyond a simple avoidance of harm to doing actual practical good, if we are focused on love, we will at least not bring harm, which fulfills a primary purpose of the law. And the law could protect from harm, but we go further and seek to do positive good. And so he says love will guarantee that we fulfill the lowest requirement, but also help us to go on to what God has really called us to do. And so for all of this, Paul begins, as he focuses us at the end of this, uh, this section in the book of Romans, he wants to remind us that we are to measure ourselves by how we love those people who are closest around us. So let's do that for a moment. Here's just some, some application points for this section. The first one is this, examine your closest circles of relationships to assess your growth in love. I'll slow down examine so so how do we know how we're developing in genuine love well we examine the closest sets of relationships to us our closest neighbors i would say those neighbors that dwell inside our own house <laughs> how are we at living out genuine love to them how about when we think about loving our community those neighbors who live closest to your door Man, one way to fail to love is neglect, right? We could actually neglect to care about those people who live closest in proximity to us. You see, God calls us to love our actual neighbors, not just our, the people in our community that we connect with best in a large population. I think it's, a, it's an incredibly important challenge for us to receive as a Christian uh, the, and as a church that we would take responsibility to learn, to care for, and love the neighbors that God has chosen for us. Do you realize that the place that you live, the house you live in, the neighborhood that you thought you chose is, has been ordained by God so that the people around you would experience his love? I mean, do you know that? Have you thought about the fact that you have a genuine responsibility to your actual neighbors to figure out how the fact that God has saved you, rescued you, transformed you, and has called you to love would actually impact that group of people in a way that no one else could? That you have a particular assignment from God to love your neighbors? And that one of the most powerful things we could do as a church would be to be a church that is known for loving its actual neighbors, not just the portions of the community that it feels like serving. It's life-changing, to be honest, because you'll find that your actual neighbors are incredibly different than you. What sort of barriers would you cross? What sort of interactions culturally would you learn if you loved the neighbors that were actually around you? How would it change the shape of your life if it was most likely that the neighbors that live actually around you gathered sometime around your dinner table for hospitality? It would be life-changing for most of us to embrace loving our actual neighbors and to see what it looks like for us to engage in genuine acts of love for them. So we examine our closest circles of relationships to assess our growth in love, and we engage in meaningful relationships with our actual neighbors to grow in love. So there's both an opportunity to assess ourselves, to look around and go, how are the pe people around me experiencing the genuineness of my love? People closest to me. And then, if you really want to grow in love, just draw a circle around your house, make those doors and figure out, how do I make sure that the fact that I am that person's neighbor is a blessing to them. How do I do it? And you'll find it takes growth in love. It will transform your ability to think about love to do that. So that's the, that's the big thing, you know, and it feels as though that would be a sufficient sermon in my mind. And some of you are probably like, yeah, amen, let's, let's go ahead and wrap this thing up and land the plane. But at the end of the chapter, Paul does something that I think is incredibly necessary for us to take to heart. He issues a wake-up call of genuine urgency. Genuine urgency in the task. Paul does not just want individuals to walk with the Lord and fulfill the calling of spiritual devotion. 
He doesn't want them just individuals to do this, to, to experience the calling of loving others in the mission that he's been urging us toward through this book. He wants the whole church to be engaged in a unified effort for maximum impact. He wants us to be a community that, that where the synergy of belonging together, the power that comes from being together, actually causes a greater impact because we are moving in the same direction. Imagine what it looks like for a church like ours, with all of our different backgrounds, to be devoted to the singular task of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus and loving our neighbor with clarity and specificity. It could have an incredible impact on people's lives right here in our community. And Paul is concerned about that, but he believes that the Christians in Rome lack a sense of urgency. That they're busy with other things. And we lack a sense of urgency. Not just about the mission. Because in a moment, we're going to see that he's saying we lack a a sense of urgency about parting with the things that distract us, with the sin that entangles us from really living with a sense of freedom in this calling and mission. That there's a real urgency for us to leave behind the foolishness of sin and get on with being devoted to Christ. And those things that will survive for eternity. He believes that the Roman church lacked that sense of urgency. And I believe that we are often challenged with this same lack of urgency. It's a whole other thing for the the entire church to be filled with a sense of urgency in action. And he believes this will happen when we live like the lights are being turned on for good. Now, how does he get at this? He says that we will feel this urgency when we believe the lights are being turned on permanently over our lives and the future of this world. He uses all of this language this way. The primary word picture Paul uses as he turns the corner here at the end, verse 11, by this Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to, say it with me, wake from sleep. Wake from sleep. Why does he say that? Wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So Paul imagines this picture of the dawning of a new day and he says the sun's already shining. It is time for us to wake up because the light is going to continue to expose who we are and it is calling us forward into better things. So he says it's time to wake up. You see, Paul doesn't want us slumbering on in life, missing what God himself has prepared for us. So he says, wake up. Some of us need the urgency of being called to wake up today. There is danger in sleeping when we ought to be awake. Now, I think some of you, you know, I I was thinking about this. Some of you may be spiritually today where I was physically early on in my college life. I was addicted to the snooze button. Got any snoozers in the house? All right, we got some. Okay, thank you for your honesty. I'm not anymore, but some of y'all are. I was so addicted to the snooze button. I mean, it, w- it was awful. I had two roommates. You can uh, find them on the internet, Matt and uh, Matt Eaches and Phil Nepper. They will tell you stories about how many times I would snooze in the morning. I mean, we're talking five, six, seven times. While they're sitting there like all preparing for the day, they're like responsible. And, and they're getting ready for the day, and I'm just like popping up, hitting that button. You know, over and over again while it's getting later and later and closer to the time of having to be somewhere. That's just as me. You know, I would irresponsibly, I would like stay up late doing really unimportant things, like very unimportant things, eating Papa John's at 2 a.m., you know. And uh, there, you know, I would stay up late and do these unimportant things, and then I would hit the snooze button over and over until sometimes I'd be late for class. Don't let my college daughters hear that too loudly. 
Have any of you all been, I mean, you, you've been addicted to the snooze button. Some of us have been there, right? I mean, here's the thing about the snooze button. It's the worst kind of sleep, isn't it? I mean, if you're experienced, you know, right? Th- like, this is the worst kind of sleep you could possibly have. You know deep down that you need to get out of bed. The time for sleeping is over. You had your chance. It's past. And when you get to the third or fourth round, what are you even doing, right? The sleep isn't any good at that point. You just can't bring yourself to face the day and its real responsibilities because you wasted the night on frivolous things. And Paul says, you know what time it is that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. And that is where you're at spiritually. Some of us are spiritually hitting the snooze button on our lives. And you're stuck on snooze today. And Paul says, it's time to wake up. Paul's wake-up call is so rich that I hear it in, in multiple ways in this passage. First, he says, wake up and prepare to meet the Lord. You can hear this negatively or positively, depending on how you are doing but he says our salvation is nearer than we first believed it's time to wake up because there is an important person that we are going to see and so here he imagines our spiritual life like a night of darkness living in sin but then seeing the dawn of Jesus gospel in our life and beginning to embrace that truth and believing but in our immaturity still wanting to kind of slumber in the darkness But he says, listen, the day, the day is marching on. And there's coming an appointment in that day when the salvation that has been promised, Jesus himself is going to rule and reign over our lives. In the time for you to be able to contribute to his kingdom, for you to prepare yourself to be the person that you desire to be in light of the gospel of Jesus and see your Savior face to face, that time is coming and you are sleeping. And he says, wake up. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what sort of person do you want to be when you meet the Lord? Like, what do you want to be true about what's changed in your life and who you are and the kind of character that's been developed? Have you ever asked yourself, what do you want to have accomplished? You see, he's saying, wake up, there's an urgency. You have a limited amount of time before you will see the Lord in your salvation. It will be sweet, but will you have regret in that day? He says, as the light comes on and it gets brighter and brighter, we will regret the things of darkness. And so he says, wake up. Get on with the task. You are going to stand before Jesus and give an account for your lives. And you can do it with joy in the freedom of the gospel, the forgiveness of the gospel. But you don't want to stay where you're at. Wake up. The Lord is coming. I actually think Paul has a tone of excitement here. He's preparing us to lean in to serving the Lord wholeheartedly as a way of anticipating his kingdom. He imagines us like a warrior armed in light and having accomplished the task we've been assigned in the kingdom of God and excited for the arrival of the king to see what we've been doing. When we know we are going to see someone we love, it's not hard to wake up in the morning, is it? I mean, I had no trouble getting out of bed the morning before Annie and I got married. I mean, it just woke right up. I didn't have my tux. I'd forgotten it at the tuxedo place. But I was awake early, which allowed me to solve the problem. But I can remember, you know, when you know you're going to go see someone. It's not hard to wake up when you're excited. You see, what he's saying is, wake up. Jesus is coming. The fullness of our salvation is a reason for us to wake up from the slumber of our sin and sleep and lethargy to really devote ourselves for a space of time to the task of bringing him glory with our lives. And I just wonder, have you have you begun to wake up and get on with a sense of urgency? Another way he says wake up, he says wake up and see your sin in the light of day. I think this one, just listen in with me for a second. 
in addition to this sense of urgency in general to be about glorifying Jesus, the urgency applies, he says, to casting off the work of darkness. No longer living in sexual immorality or drunkenness or sensuality or quarreling or jealousy. Here he imagines, listen, our lives uh, like this inside this metaphor. We've lived in a dark night of sin, but as the dawn breaks and we see the truth of the gospel, our sin looks different in the light of the day. And as the light shines brighter and brighter and the sun continues to rise over our lives, the real nature of our sinful activity will be exposed and we will regret not parting with it sooner. Some of us have things in our lives that so hinder us from spiritual freedom and life and the ability to, to engage with joy in the work of God's kingdom because we are chained to sin that we have held fast to, that we believe we need, that we continue to feed and nourish and provide provision for, and we are not willing to let it go. And he says, wake up! The lights are being turned on. Do you know what that's going to look like in the light of day? You see, things done in the darkness sometimes appear to be okay. But when it gets lighter and lighter and lighter and the deeds of darkness are exposed, we begin to see them for what they are. And I wonder if you recognize that there's going to be a time in your life where the things that you believed you had to hold on to, you had to give into. That was so important to you, yet God forbids you from participating in it. They're going to look really foolish, disgusting, and ugly in the full light of day. I was reminded of this uh, several years ago. I went to this church in L.A., and it was in a nightclub, but it was uh, on Sunday morning. And uh, it was light, <laughs> you know, the light coming through the windows, the lights were on. And uh, it was, a I mean, it was kind of a cool place to go to church, you know, for it's, we love church planning. We'll start churches anywhere you can. But this was a, like an L.A. nightclub that was bumping on Saturday night. And then on Sunday morning, you know, it's a church. And because uh, yeah, it had a stage anywhere we can get a little bit of way to set up and get the chairs going, you know. And so we go to this church and I remember walking into this nightclub with the lights all on and looking around being like, Wow, this place is a dump. You know, the, the walls are all beat up. And I imagine, you know, if you turn the lights down really low and you add some ambiance and everything's set right, this place looks really cool. You know, you got the flashing of the ball and the, you got stuff, you know, music playing in the background and everybody's having a good time. But if they, if they had the lights on, they'd kind of maybe be disgusted with the place. And it's probably true of what actually happens in that place. But, but the reality is there are things that look fine in the darkness, in the cover of secrecy, that when they're exposed, they just look really foolish. I think this was also true, you know, Pillar DC used to meet at the Ugly Mug, which is uh, a, a bar in uh, downtown DC there on Barracks Row at 8th and I, and, uh, and you know, it was always like, this, you know, when you turn the lights on and bring people in there, you want to babysit their kids in the, some of the rooms, it's a little like, eh, you know, it looks fine for a bar, but maybe not a kid's space. You know, when everybody's like wanting everything wiped down and all that. And you're like, yeah, this doesn't so look, with the lights on, you know, this doesn't look so good. We all feel that when we walk into our bathroom and turn on the bright lights of our vanity mirror, right? And it's like, whoa, <laughs> you know, last night I seem to be doing all right. But this morning it's a little brighter. You know, I see some blemishes. This is the same idea he's getting at right now. It's funny when on that level. But have you imagined for a second what it's going to be like when that secret sin that you've been unwilling to part with is ultimately exposed? Like I, you know, with all graciousness, not out of condemnation, but that you would part from that thing before the brightness of the light exposes it. I mean, there's a difference between repentance being exposed you know some of us really need to deal with some areas of life where we've held on to sin nourishing it feeding it providing for it maybe excusing it and explaining away and th those excuses will feel really good but progressively as we go through life we come near to the day of jesus and ultimately when he shines the light of his kingdom those deeds done in darkness are going to look so incredibly foolish 
Have you considered whether that thing that you excuse that is disgusting, what, it, what you'll feel like when it's exposed to the light of God's holiness? I mean, just imagine what it would be like to expose it to the light in this room. How, how difficult that would be. You see, Paul wants us to be troubled because he wants us to act with urgency. He wants us to look at the areas of our life and part with deeds that, that God has specifically said are sinful. And that we would do it now while we have the opportunity to be the one parting with it rather than be parted with it through God's judgment and justice. So he says, have you considered the way in which your ongoing sin will look when it's exposed before the light of eternity, both in this life and at the judgment? What seems fine when hidden in the dark will look different when the light is turned on. I beg you today, find some people in your life that you can expose the ugliness of secret sin to and be prayed for. Part with it. Part with it. There's, is it. there's no other way. Sometimes we try to overthink it. We excuse things. If we could just see it and think about what it's going to look like in the light, it might be powerful enough for you today to take steps away from that sin and for you to experience an ongoing and powerful transformation. Lastly, he says, wake up and get dressed for work. We can all spot a person who slept too long and still wanted to make it somewhere on time, can't we? You see, when you've overslept, you throw on whatever you have laying around and you hurry out the door to go. And the clothes are wrinkled. They may not actually match. There was no time to think about what you were wearing. Paul says here that we need to wake up and get clothed properly. Those who are spiritually asleep do not consider what their life is really about. And they're driven by their desires. He calls this gratifying the desires of the flesh. In a sense, he is saying that if we do not wake up and realize the time for maturity has come in our lives, we will go on gratifying the flesh and its desires. It's like we are dressed in the wrong clothing for the occasion. A few years ago, I got invited to a get-together on a Saturday evening. It was just me and the kids because Annie had another engagement of some sort. And I didn't really know the people at the time that I was going to be going to hang out with. So it was like a summer Saturday evening, and I was dressed very casually, and so were the kids. And when we arrived at the get-together, it was clear that everyone else was dressed for a nicer occasion than I thought I was going to. You ever had that feeling? Like, whoa, I am way underdressed for this. I am dressed for the wrong occasion. Feels a bit awkward, like you really wish you had made better life decisions and thought this through, maybe ask some questions. Well, Paul's instruction is that we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The time for making provisions for the flesh and excusing our sin has passed. It's like showing up when, when we have a life that is riddled with gratifying the flesh and primarily about our own desires. It begins to seem like we're dressed for the wrong occasion if we're serious about loving God and being mature. And so what he says is we should think about what it looks like for us to be clothed in the Lord Jesus Christ, to be so imitating him that we've put on the Lord Jesus. Because that is the appropriate dress for any occasion for someone who claims to be a Christian. And so he says, it's time for us to, to stop excusing showing up with the wrong clothing on. And he's not talking about our outward appearance. He's talking about our ability to embody what is really good rather than showing up as someone to every occasion who mainly wants to please themselves in their own maturity. It shows up. It's, people can see it. They see through what you claim you want to be about. And you're underdressed for the occasion of serving God's mission because we don't put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're giving in to gratifying the desires of the flesh, we will all the time be showing up to every situation in life underdressed. But he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the clothing for the occasion. To do that, you've got to wake up. <laughs> We've got to wake up and think and consider and lay out that outfit and put on what we need to put on to face the situations that we are going to face, that we can be prepared to live like Christ in the light of day. Are you ready to wake up? That's the question this morning. To live in the light Jesus promised. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes as we get ready for the Lord's Supper. Maybe you need to take some time just to respond to the Lord this morning. Right there in your seat, in your state. Lord, from what I heard this morning, this 
word. I just pray that you'd give me a sense of urgency. Maybe there's something specific in your life that you just need to bring before him and then trust to him and ask for him to change and transform. Maybe you've lacked an urgency in his calling and mission. For some reason in your life, he's called you to do something specific, but you've been unwilling to do it. You think you'll always have time. Maybe right now is a moment of urgency for you. And you need to respond to the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We pray that as your spirit brings these words to life in our own hearts, Lord, that you will help us to respond in ways that will be transformative and changing. We thank you for the ongoing work of your spirit that will take these moments and bring them to life in us. Lord, give us willing and open hearts to confess our sin, to turn from it, to part ways with things in our life that dishonor you, that you might be glorified. 